Welcome to River City Church Online. Thank you for joining us today. It's our prayer that you're blessed by what you hear today. So let's go and join our pastor for this week's message. I can't begin to tell you how encouraged I am by your response to this new series that we began last Sunday. I mean, it's, it's not that I don't get feedback on the typical series uh, when we start something new. It's just the amount of feedback for this particular series on outreach and evangelism. It's been overwhelming. Uh, here's a sampling of some of the comments that I've picked up from you this past week. Uh, Daryl, thank you for getting me intentional about living out my faith at work again. Uh, you've really got me thinking. Daryl, because of last week's message, I've begun to pray for my friends who are far from Christ. Daryl, till last week, I didn't realize how self-focused and myopic I've been over these past number of months. Thank you for lifting my sights and getting me focused on other people a little bit more. And then I love this last one. Daryl, thank you for making it so clear what this church is about and what it stands for. Uh, it's helping me to make a decision for River City Church. So based on all this feedback that I've received, I can only conclude one thing, and that's that the, the missional heart for this congregation still beats very, very strongly. And I, I have to say, praise God. I'm just so thankful for that. So last time, by way of review, I spelled out some reasons that Christ followers today are being less public about their faith. And if you were here last time, you'll remember these. I, I shared, number one, that it's more complicated than it was a generation ago to share our faith. Number two, it's more difficult than it was a generation ago. And then number three, and this is true especially in our Canadian context, sharing our faith with others is actually, it's discouraged. Yes, religious views are tolerated and officially protected in Canada, but those of us who hold these views, we're expected to keep them private and to ourselves. The very opposite of sharing our faith. But if ever there was a time to keep quiet about our faith, now is not the time. This is definitely not the time. If you look on the lower part of your screen, you'll see a, a, a chart that kind of portrays the drop in church attendance between 1987 and 2012. So that's a 25 year period of time. And you can see that across the board for the different regions of Canada, it's been going down, uh, significantly down. Here in Ontario, the decline has been 11% over 25 years. And that just takes us to 2012. I would, I would contend that since 2012, church attendance has dropped at least another 11% here in Ontario. And it's not like those who have stopped attending churches are going to other churches or even to other religions. These are people who are now identifying as irreligious or religiously unaffiliated or agnostic. So obviously now is not the time to be private or silent about our faith in Jesus Christ. So let me give you a blueprint or for, for the final two weeks of this series, which is today and then next Sunday. So today I'm going to address what you need to be more public about your, your faith. And then next time I'm going to address what others need to have a chance of being reached with the gospel. So today it's what you need and next time it's what others need. So number one, what you need to be more public about your faith, you need three things. You need three things. And the three things that you need are boldness, humility, and love. Boldness, humility, and love. If you're watching this uh, on screen with some friends, I want you to turn to someone next to you and say, you need three things. And give them a chance to say that back to you. You need three things. All right, if you've done that, then I want you to say, you need boldness, you need humility, and you need love. Go ahead and say that to someone that you're watching this with. You need boldness, you need humility, and you need love. 
Now the Bible in John chapter 4 records a story where Jesus employs all three traits in one single story, which makes it incredibly powerful. So let's open our Bibles now to John chapter 4. For those of you new to Scripture, uh, John is uh, in the New Testament. It's one of the four Gospels. You have Matthew, then Mark, then Luke. John is the fourth Gospel. Uh, if, if you've got a Bible, you would open it probably about four-fifths of the way through to the end. Uh, if you get to Acts or Romans, you've gone too far. So go to John chapter 4. And as I read through this, starting at verse 1, the very beginning of the chapter, Watch how Jesus employs boldness and humility and love in this interaction as he shares faith with another person. And then watch too to see what effect this has, not just on the person that he's sharing his faith with, but on a whole village of people. It's an amazing story. So John chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. That's a reference to John the Baptist. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptized, but it was his disciples. So, he left Judea and he went back once more to Galilee. So, we'll hit pause right there. Jesus has been ministering in Judea, which is the the most southern uh, tribe or the most southern region in the land. And he's been having huge success, right? People are getting baptized and his success is not unnoticed by his enemies who are envious of all the attention that he's getting. And his enemies here would be the Pharisees in Judea. And things are now risky for him. They're risky for him because the Pharisees might attempt to arrest him or they might even attempt to kill him. And since this is early in his ministry, he's still got lots to do before his arrest and crucifixion ultimately arrive. Jesus decides to do the wise thing. He decides to take his disciples from Judea and take them all the way to the most northern territory or province, which is Galilee, the most northern territory. And he's going to then create some distance between where he's going to be and where these irate Pharisees are down in Judea. Now, the next verse, verse 4, is curious. Now, he had to go through Samaria. And this is curious because as the map on your screen shows, Jews avoided travel through Samaria. You can see a red dotted line, and it illustrates that the Jews would go all the way around Samaria rather than go through it, even though that made their journey to Galilee a lot longer. And the reason was Jews avoided Samaritans at all costs. Jews and Samaritans hated one another. In some ways, not unlike the relation between Jews and Palestinians in our present moment. Now, from the Jewish side, they considered the Samaritans a a, a mixed race. Uh, For those of you who are Harry Potter fans, Think of Hermione, think about muggles or half-bloods, and think about the Malfoy and his family and how they viewed the muggles. They viewed them as a, a mixed race. And so, literally, contact with the Samaritan made a Jew ceremonially unclean for going to the temple and for worship and all the rest. In fact, the Pharisees believed that you became contaminated and unclean if even the shadow of a Samaritan fell upon you if even their shadow touched you. And yet here we read in verse 4 that Jesus had to go through Samaria. What, what's, what's up with that? Why does John include the word had? Well, pay attention to the story, and maybe by the end you can answer for yourself. Now, before I read the next section, I want you to consider, first and foremost, Jesus' boldness. I talked about how we need boldness. Jesus refused to live by the cultural restrictions that other Jews, his his fellow Jewish people, lived by. He treated instead every human being with dignity and respect. Not only that, he didn't let the presuppositions of his people shape his own opinions, but he saw each and every human being as an image bearer of the Creator God, of God his Father. And here, Jesus evidenced massive boldness. And that's the first thing that we need to do if we're going to be public about our faith. We need to be like Jesus. We need to be bold. Let's go to verse 5. So he, that is Jesus, came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, 
near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob and Joseph were patriarchs of the faith. You can read about them in the book of Genesis if you want to look that up yourself. So they're near this place, and it says Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Again, let's hit pause right there, because here we see Jesus' evidence, the second trait that we need to be more public about our faith, and that's the trait of humility. He demonstrates humility, and he does so in many ways. First and foremost, I think he demonstrates humility by acknowledging he's tired and feeling weak. He's, he says to his disciples, go, go ahead, you guys can go to town. I'm tired. I'm just going to stay by this well and rest right here. Some of us, this idea of Jesus being physically weak, that's a new idea, but it's, it's significant, isn't it? He also evidences humility by talking to a Samaritan woman. No respectful or respectable Jewish man would talk to a woman alone like this, let alone a Samaritan woman. And yet Jesus does. And he doesn't just make small talk, right? He, he demonstrates even more humility, asking if she can give him a drink of water. I've, I've got a need. You've got a bucket. Would you be so kind as to give me some of your water? Now, if even the shadow of a Samaritan falling or touching on a Jewish person contaminated them and made them unclean, imagine how unclean Jesus would be if he's drinking from the same vessel as a Samaritan. <laughs> Talk about boldness and courage, right? Verse 9. Let's continue to see what happens next. Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then John adds the following. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, let alone use their dishes. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, do you see what Jesus has just gone and done here? He's injected curiosity into the conversation. He's setting this woman, the Samaritan woman, up for having a spiritual conversation. Meaning, Jesus isn't just looking to have a physical need met. He's not just looking to quench his thirst. He's talking to this Samaritan woman out of choice. He's made a choice to make time for her and to interact with her. He genuinely cares about her. The third trait that we need to be more public about our faith is love. And I'm going to maintain that Jesus loved this woman and he was concerned about her relationship with God. And love is what motivates everything that follows in the rest of this story. Not necessity, not just needing a drink of water. So River City, to be more public about our faith, we're going to need boldness. We're going to need humility. And most of all, we're going to need love. We're going to need love. So let's watch how this spiritual conversation unfolds, picking up at verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from this well himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So they're having a spiritual conversation, but at this point, the woman still doesn't get it, right? Uh, it's, it's like Jesus and the woman are, are talking on parallel lines. He's talking about spiritual water. She's still talking about physical water, and, and the lines are not intersect, intersecting at this point. So in the verses that follow, Jesus opens up her eyes. And as I read this, look again at Jesus' boldness here. Verse 16. 
Jesus told her, Go, call your husband and come back. Uh, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And now we know why John in his gospel includes that tiny little detail at the end of verse six about the time of the day, about it being noon. Because in that culture, drawing water from the well was considered women's work. It was something that women would ordinarily do. And first, they would do it together for safety in numbers. Second, they would do it first thing in the morning before the sun came high in the sky and it was hot. And they would do it in the evening as the sun was going down. And yet this woman, she comes at the hottest part of the day and she comes alone. She, she breaks from social convention on two levels, right? And the reason is she doesn't want to bump into her neighbors. She wants to be left completely alone. She lived with shame. She carried humiliation. This woman had done what so many in our day too do, right? We, we, we jump from relationship to a relationship to relationship, looking for that one relationship that's going to meet all of our needs and, and fill all of our longings. And we remain oblivious to, or maybe ignorant of the fact that God didn't wire any one person to meet all of your needs or all of mine. Right? That's just impossible. And it's an impossible expectation to put on another person. Our hearts are restless until they ultimately find their rest in a relationship with God, a restored relationship through his son, Jesus Christ, our savior. That's just the way God created us. And so much marketing and advertising in our day promotes this idea that if, if you just persevere and if you just persist, you're going to find your soulmate. And if you're lucky enough, you'll never be wanting. You'll never feel boredom. You'll never feel like there's a void inside waiting to be filled. This woman is at the well at noon, and she's likely an outcast in her village. She'd failed at relationships. Her life was, well... It was messy, right? It was messy. And her reputation wouldn't have been a good reputation. It would have been bad. Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, which is Mount Gerizim. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, I want to just kind of listen to this statement in the context of what happened just before this. It took more boldness for Jesus to share these personal and intimate details with this woman at the well. But he must have shared in humility and love because she doesn't, she doesn't turn and walk away. She doesn't storm away from the scene. She continues to engage him in conversation. That said, she deflects the focus away from herself. And she does so by bringing up this classic theological debate. Hey, we're not the only time that has theological debates. They had them back then too. And in this debate, the Jews were solidly on one side and the Samaritans were solidly on another side. And they came to different conclusions. Her question relates to where should God be worshipped? Should God be worshipped here at Mount Gerizim, which is the answer the Samaritans would give, or in Jerusalem, which is the answer that the Jews would give? Well, let's see how Jesus answers this theological question. Verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship God the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, listen to this, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they're the kind of worshipers that God the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. I love this. Do you see what Jesus has done? 
He didn't give her the typical Jewish answer to the theological question that she posed. If he had done that, then she could have turned and walked away and said, you're the same as every other Jew. You see me as an outcast, and I've had enough of this conversation. He doesn't defend the Jewish tradition. And if he had, it would have been basically like the diagram on your screen. It would be that he'd drawn a circle of all the people who could be included in God's family. And she, the Samaritan woman, would have been like the X. She would have been outside of that circle, an outcast without hope of salvation. But Jesus did not do that. Instead, he, he drew a circle that could include Jews and Samaritans and any person who sincerely endeavored to worship God the Father. The key wasn't a geographic location. The key was worshiping in spirit and in truth. It had to do with the heart, not a piece of land. And I wonder, I have to wonder, if this present conflict between Israel and Palestine wouldn't abate if both sides focused more on the heart and less on a piece of land. At any rate, Jesus now had the woman exactly where he wanted her. So they're no longer talking on parallel lines, right? They're having a spiritual conversation. Jesus is, and so is she. And we know this because of what happens next. Verse 25, the woman said, love this. I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. It's like a mic drop, right? I, the one speaking to you, am the Messiah, the Christ. So now this woman has a decision to make. She's got a big decision to make. Did she, in light of Jesus' boldness and humility and love, did she, in light of the fact that she knew at this point that he's at least a prophet because he knew these intimate personal details about her life, did she, in light of the fact that he gave such a profound, unexpected, hope-filled, and potentially liberating answer to that question about where should we worship God, did she, in light of all of those factors, believe that he was who he said he was, namely the promised Messiah. Would she accept Jesus and believe in him? We'll hold that question. Let's go to verse 27. <laughs> Just then his disciples returned, right? They're, they're there with their food run and they're surprised to find Jesus talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want of the woman, right? What do you want with our teacher or our rabbi? And no one asked Jesus, why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her jar of water, the woman went back to the town and said to the townsfolk, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Wait a minute. She she left her water jar? She went to the well to get water. She left the water jar because she'd found living water. She'd found whom she believed to be the Messiah. Now, last time in the message that opened this series, I shared how a lot of uh, Christ followers today are are terrified or frightened by the word evangelism, right? And certainly we've seen and heard many bad examples of evangelism in practice. But what this woman does with her townsfolk is evangelize, right? She essentially says to her neighbors, You know my life because you're my neighbors, right? You know about my past, you know about my present, but I just met a total stranger and a Jew, someone who isn't normally in this territory, let alone with our people. I just met a total stranger who know the most intimate details of my life. And yet he treated me with respect, kindness, and love. Could this be the Messiah? That's evangelism. Evangelism is simply you telling your story of the difference that knowing Jesus has made for you in your life. That's it. No fancy formula. It's just you telling your story of the difference of your knowing Jesus. Well, Jesus here evidenced all three traits of boldness and humility and love. But so does the woman. Number one, she comes out of hiding. We say, well, how out 
is she? Well, she's in the center of her village, in the center of her town. She's in the city square. That's boldness, especially for someone with a past like her. Number two, she's not concerned about what her neighbors are going to say. She doesn't even care ultimately with whether they believe her story. She just knows that she must share this good news with them. That's humility. That's where you've got a message and you've got to give it regardless of the consequences. And number three, she's not concerned about her reputation anymore. Or if she is, she's concerned about something far more, and that's evidence of love. She wants her neighbors, if this is the Messiah, she wants them to have equal opportunity to her to meet and believe in Jesus for themselves. Boldness, humility, and love just demonstrates such a, a powerful picture of how Jesus is the best teacher who ever lived. He just had done boldness, humility, and love with her, and now she's doing the exact same thing with her neighbors like teacher, like student, and then we need to be students like the woman at the well. These are what you and I need to be public about our faith. And when we share our story of what Jesus has done in our lives with boldness, humility, and love, people will respond as they do in our text. Verse 30, they, that's her neighbors, they came out of the town and made their way toward Jesus. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said, I imagine they're mumbling to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. We'll pause there for a second. Because too often, and I even catch myself doing this sometimes. Too often, we Christians, we excuse ourselves from sharing our faith or witnessing or evangelizing family and friends because we're like, they're just not ready to believe. We make the decision for them, in other words, and so we remain quiet. And yet here in our text, Jesus makes it clear that all around us, all around us, a continual, continual harvest waits to be reaped. He's just looking for faithful harvesters, and that's what we get the opportunity and the privilege to be. See, the greatest barrier in our day to people accepting Jesus as their Savior, it's not the people, it's not the mission field. The greatest barrier is what's in here, what's in the minds of our people. Do we put limits on what God is able to do? And when it comes to witnessing, when it comes to evangelism, this next verse for me is, is so encouraging. Verse 36. Jesus continued, even now the one who reaps draws a wage and the harvest and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. That's Jesus' desire. That's the Father's desire. Joy for the sower and joy for the reaper. Jesus desires joy for us, people of God. And there's no greater joy than sharing our faith with someone and leading them to Jesus Christ. I love how uh, Jeremiah Capuli puts it. Uh, Jeremiah is a Filipino church planter in Edmonton, Alberta. He was a speaker at the, uh, the conference that I was at two weeks ago. And uh, Jeremiah was born in the Phil Philippines. He had a really good job. He was successful as an evangelist there. And yet he had a dream, a, a literal dream from God that he was to come with his family to Canada to plant a church, an even greater mission field. And so he obeyed and he came to Canada and this man's story is amazing. He's having huge evangelistic success, not just in Edmonton, but all throughout Alberta, and it's going to continue. I have every confidence of this. On the day that Jeremiah baptizes brand new believers in Jesus, he tells them this. He tells them four things. This is before he's immersing them in the water of baptism. He says, hey, it is a great blessing to follow Jesus. Hey, it's an even greater blessing to live for Jesus. Hey, it's an even greater blessing to make more disciples for Jesus. And the greatest blessing, <laughs> the greatest blessing is to equip 
other disciples to make more disciples for Jesus. Like Jesus did with the woman at the well. And like this woman did with her neighbors in the village. And the end result is in verse 39. I'll read this right to the end of verse 42. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Many. Maybe that's why John writes at the beginning of our text that Jesus had to go to Samaria. Maybe that's the had right there. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And Jesus stayed two days. And because of Jesus' words, many more became believers They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Isn't that an amazing story? I mean, I I think that's one of the most powerful stories in the gospels or in scripture period. I'm so inspired by John chapter four. And what we see here isn't the result of uh, some complex theological argument that you've got to go to grad school to master. It's not the result of complex apologetics that you've got to read a stack of books in order to be able to be persuasive in evangelism. It's not about memorizing dozens and dozens of Bible passages so you can, you know, win an argument or a debate with another person. All it took were three things, boldness, humility, and love. And the best part is that everyone here, from the youngest to the oldest, can do these three things. We can all be bold, we can all be humble, and we can all show love to other people. So in conclusion, I want to wrap up by addressing one final question. Why these three? Why boldness and humility and love? I mean, conceivably, there could be other things, There could be more things. Why these three? And the answer is because these three directly counteract the three reasons for evangelistic unfruitfulness. According to Tim Keller, the late, great Tim Keller, there are three reasons for evangelistic unfruitfulness, and they are a lack of courage, a lack of sensitivity, and indifference. Lack of courage, lack of sensitivity, and indifference. So we counter a lack of courage with boldness, right? The first thing, the boldness of knowing that we are unconditionally loved by God the Father. There's lack of sensitivity. We counter the lack of sensitivity by humility, The humility of knowing that we too are undeserving sinners in need of God's grace every single day, just like anyone we talk to. And so we never share our faith without coming from an approach of humility and respect for the other person. And there's indifference in our day. We look around and we see people struggling to find meaning and satisfaction and hope and confidence in life. We see them spinning their wheels again and again. And if we're quiet, instead of sharing the reason for the hope that we have, then we're failing in our love for them. But the gospel produces love inside of us as we read in Galatians chapter five, verse six. And I'm gonna quote this. For in Christ Jesus, not only the greatest teacher, as we see in our text, God's son, our true savior in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Let's, let's, let's pray river city. Lord God, thank you for your word. Your word is true. Thank you for moving John to include this incredible, amazing, inspirational passage about Jesus sharing the faith with boldness, with humility, and with love. And not only do we get one example of this from Jesus, our teacher and savior, but we get, we get two examples because the woman who was on the receiving end, she became a giver of the self-same thing. She went to her village with boldness, with humility, 
and with love. And as she learned from Jesus, Father, I pray that we, your church today, would learn from this woman at the well, that she could be our model of how to evangelize, to not make it about fancy arguments and quoting passage after passage, but we just tell the story of the difference knowing your son Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord has made in our lives. And that we do that boldly. We do that with humility. And most of all, we do it in love. Lord, uh, would your spirit work in me to be this kind of a follower of Jesus, that I would have more boldness and more humility and even a greater love for all people, even as you do. And I pray that of River City Church, that all of us hearing this, whether we're healing, hearing it in person today or whether we're hearing it online, that we would devote ourselves to you, to sharing the good news with boldness and with humility and love so that we would know the joy of being part of the workers in your harvest and that that joy would transform our lives and be part of our witness and that all the glory would go to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have an awesome day. Thanks for checking us out today. We hope that you will join us here on YouTube or in person next week to continue our study of God's Word. It would be really helpful if you could like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribing is one of the best ways to stay connected with our church as we journey together in our study of God's Word and growing to be more like Jesus Christ. If you have questions about your faith, please go to our website, rivercitychurch.org, and click on the Contact Us tab. We would love to hear from you and learn how we can serve you better. We exist in this community because of generous support from donors like you. If you would like to support this ministry because you were blessed by what you heard today, please go to our website, rivercitychurch.org, and click on the Giving tab. There'll be all kinds of options there for you where you can give to support our ministry in Cambridge, Ontario. Have a great week. I hope that God surprises you with his love today and every day. Thanks for watching.